all here this evening. Beautiful summer-like day, wasn't it? And so I don't think there's many of those left. So we're moving into that wonderful season called fall. Have you started to see the leaves changing color yet? Seen it in a few places. And so we know that the, there's going to be some real beautiful scenes here coming up in the next few weeks. And just think of the one that created all that. Isn't that exciting? Well, let's turn our hymnals to number 263. 263. As we sing, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. We'll sing the first, the third, and the last verses. The Lord's our rock in Him we hide A shelter in the time of storm Secure whatever ill be tied A shelter in the time of storm Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land A weary shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. shelter in the time of storm. O rock divine, O refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary Great to have that shelter because the storms of life do come, don't they? And isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is there and Jesus knows all about our troubles and Jesus loves us and he cares for us. I'm going to ask Brother Blake, could you open our service in prayer tonight, please? Let's turn to number 268, 268, as we sing, How Firm a Foundation. And so we'll sing the first, the second, and the last verses, one, two, and five. Stand upheld by my 
Pretty forceful, isn't it? I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That's pretty, pretty uh, resounding, isn't it? He's never going to forsake us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And so we have a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. Well, let's have a look at our announcements. And so coming up, uh, just a reminder to the deacons that we are planning a deacons meeting tomorrow evening at 630 here at the church, and so uh, please plan on attending. And uh, coming up on Friday is actually the men's retreat down at uh, Windcrest Bible Camp, so Friday and Saturday. And so be praying about that. I don't know if we have anyone that's headed down, but uh, just pray that the Lord will work there, right? In the hearts of men. And so uh, something the church needs today is men that will... Take a stand for the Lord, right? And take leadership in the church, right? And uh, coming up, of course, Sunday is our regular services. So 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. And then, of course, uh, we've been mentioning coming up in November that there is a fall missions youth retreat over at Emmanuel Baptist Church on the 7th of November. And so uh, people can... Our teens can start inviting friends to come. And so be praying about that. Pray for our teens. Uh, pray for our young people uh, starting school this week. And so finally back to some sense of normalcy, I guess. And so continue to pray for them through these times. I think that's all we have for announcements. And so let's go to number 265 in our hymnals. 265. We have an anchor. And so we'll sing all three verses. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the same. Savior's hand. Though the tempest rage and the wild winds blow, not an angry wave shall our bark o'erflow. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which can In the Savior's love, when our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms all past. 
right. Well, that's good singing this evening. Turn it over now to Pastor Hodder. All right, let's take our Bibles tonight. We are going to turn to Psalm number 18. Psalm number 18. This psalm is uh, attributed to King David as the author and suspected it was... Uh, during and shortly after perhaps a time in which David had been pursued by King Saul. Understand that we have uh, a, a man who was, uh, if you recall, as a young man, a shepherd boy, tending to his father's flocks. And when uh, Samuel was given the task to select uh, an individual by God that would follow King Saul as the next king of Israel, David was not even one of the individuals that was brought by his father Jesse uh, to Samuel to be even considered. And of course, as uh, if you do recall the passage, as the selection, as the, the brothers are presented before Samuel and the selection is made, he makes it clear that not one of them was suitable to the task to be selected as the next king. And as the story goes, the, they then go seek after David to come, and Samuel will then anoint David, and of course David will be marked as uh, the individual that would, be, that would follow King Saul. And what's amazing is, you know, David being the least significant in the family, uh, not a very significant uh, position as far as uh, duties and whatnot. He was a shepherd, and he would go from the position of shepherd to be uh, the one who would, uh, he, he was chosen by King Saul to wind up in the palace and be the one that would console King Saul. So that's quite a shift when you think about it. Now, God's anointing is a put on him to be the future king. Saul would select him after the battle with uh, Goliath, where David gets the victory over Goliath, and bring him to the palace. David would play music to soothe Saul. But, of course, we understand that jealousy entered into the heart of Saul when Saul figured out, King Saul figured out that God's blessing had shifted from him to David. And then, over, of course, for the next while, King Saul would give his attention to basically killing David. So you can imagine being, you know, chosen as that one that would be brought to the palace to be the, 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 the soother, if you like, for King Saul, to now all of a sudden Saul is seeking after David's life. You know, bitterness had turned to hatred, and Saul, in fact, spent a lot of time that he probably could have been better spent leading the nation, uh, seeking after David. And, of course, he'll not be victorious in that, and eventually uh, David would be king. Uh, as you look at Psalm number 18 and verse 1 here, we see, basically, David's cry to God, reflecting on the fact that he had been pursued by an enemy, Sadly enough, an enemy that was very close to him. And sometimes that happens to us, doesn't it? Those that we think are our friends turn into our enemies. Uh, that, you know, as we enter into the, the last days, that's one thing that will certainly be characteristic of uh, the last days before, the, uh, before the, Jesus sets up the kingdom, is that there will be that kind of that same attitude where uh, you'll feel like you won't be able to trust anybody, that even your friends may be your enemy, and how sad that will be. Needless to say, we have David here uh, 
responding, crying out to God, if you like, or praising God for the fact that through it all, despite the fact that David had gone from being favored by the king to being pursued relentlessly by the king, he knew his God was still by his side. You remember when he went up against Goliath? You know, they looked upon David, and David uh, they, get, they uh, fitted uh, David up with uh, armor that was not made for him, that was too big for him. And, of course, David rejects it and says, you know, this is, I've never, I haven't tried it, I haven't proved it, it's not suitable for, for me and my size. And so David says, I don't need that armor because I have my God, which is quite a statement. That's the kind of, you know, the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. And David trusted in God. And I think we see that here as we read through this. He says here, we'll read down through, but I really want to pay attention to verse number two tonight. He says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. <coughs> Excuse me. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord... And cried unto my God. He heard my voice, and out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. And then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken, because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and the fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. And the brightness that was before him was thick clouds past, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice hailstones and coals of fire. We won't continue reading down through uh, the psalm there, but we see this incredible God that God that David is crying out to and praising because David was able to trust in him. A couple of things I want to draw your attention to tonight is this. In verse number two, he begins by saying, the Lord is my rock. The idea that David has in mind that uh, the Lord was his place of refuge or a high rock, a high place, if you like. It's kind of that idea of uh, being able to be, uh, you, you know, I think of, uh, uh, you know, if you're into uh, a crowd of people and you're there with uh, a small child or maybe your grandchild, and if things get busy, what do you usually do? You don't just let them wander through the crowd. You kind of pick them up and bring them up to a high place where you know they're going to be protected. He calls God his, his rock, his place. The idea there, the Hebrew word that's used for rock there has the idea of being a place of refuge or a, a high place, a place raised up and lifted up from danger. Look at uh, Psalm 27. Psalm number 27. Again, David commenting here. He says, The Lord is my light in verse 1 and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What a desire David has here. 
we see reflected in this particular psalm, in the fact that he says, I desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may do what? You know, one thing that he strived to seek after is to dwell in the house of the Lord. David was a busy man. doesn't mean he devoted all his time to simply being in the house of God. But what David did is throughout his life and everything he did, and of course we know he didn't do it perfectly, David made some incredible mistakes, didn't he? Committed some uh, grievous sins against God. But needless to say, he still desired, his greatest desire was uh, to seek after the Lord, and as he said, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. In other words, to dwell, his desire was to dwell in God's presence, to dwell in God's will, striving to be obedient to God, trusting in God, depending on God for everything. Look at verse 5. He says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me, what? Up upon a rock. You know, you have that kind of this uh, imagery here of David being taken up out of the dangers and being placed upon that, that high rock of protection for him. And that's what God was to him, that place of protection, that place of being lifted up and kind of removed from the dangers that he he was in uh, this one thing there is a lot of around uh, Israel is high rocks uh, especially when you consider uh, you know Jerusalem and uh, kind of down from Jerusalem towards the Jordan River and that region is very dry and arid and you see a lot of high rocks, a lot of, you know, you, it's easy for them to get this whole picture of seeing God as that uh, high place of refuge. Look at Psalm 61. Psalm 61. And verse 1, he says, Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And of course, referring to lead me to you know, God's position of safety. He is his rock. 1 Samuel chapter 23 1 Samuel 23, we find David being chased by King Saul. Saul has been relentless in pursuing him. And we look at uh, 1 Samuel 23. And verse 27, it says, But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. So he's, he's chasing after David, and the messengers come and basically say, Saul, we need your attention over here. The Philistines are becoming a problem. And it says in verse 28, Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines, and therefore they called that place... Selahamakala, and David went up from thence and dwelt in the what? In the strongholds in Engedi. Engedi is a place down along the the um, Dead Sea there, or as you make your way down towards the down uh, kind of that southern end of uh, the Jordan and down around the top of the Dead Sea, and. Uh, there's a place there where uh, David hid up in the hills and hid up in the mountains there. And there's kind of a, a river valley. Most of the time it's dry, runs uh, right down into that area. And that's where David was hiding up in those, in those caves up there. Eventually, if you read on, and we won't read tonight, but if you read on there, 
you discover that uh, Saul actually pursues uh, David into one of those caves up there, and uh, David would cut off the, the end of his skirt. And uh, David had the chance to kill Saul, even though Saul pursued after him relentlessly, but David refuses to do that. But he shows him how close he came. And, uh, but again, you, you get that uh, sense of, that, that those caves became David's protection, that high place of protection, just as David viewed God. And, uh, you know, God protected David. And re recognizing that up until this point, David had not served as king yet, but God had anointed him. And so one day he would be king, and God would, of course, he would not allow King Saul to, to kill David because God's plan was for David to take over the, you know, take over the reign of the nation of Israel. But David calls God his rock, his place of refuge, his high place. Not only does he call him his rock, but he calls him, if you look at Psalm 18 again in verse 2, he says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. His description of God being his fortress has the idea of being a place of protection. Look at Psalm 31. Psalm 31. He says in verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me, for thou art my rock. You see that reference to God being his rock. And he says, and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. So you get this picture of God as his high place of protection, but also God is his fortress. In other words, God basically has put a hedge around David. You get that same idea with uh, Job. Remember when uh, Satan comes before God with the sons of God and uh, Satan basically uh, uh, challenges God on Job. God presents Job and says, look, you know, my faithful servant who worships me. And, and Job says to God, he says, he says, sure, uh, or Satan says to God, sure, Job will worship you and be faithful to you because you've put a hedge of protection around him. And then, of course, God allows the trials that takes place in Job's life to prove that Job genuinely loved God and worshipped God. And, of course, that's another study for another time. But the idea being is God is our place of protection. You know, God is that hedge, if you like, a protection around us. And it's, it's wonderful to have that kind of idea of who God is when we think of, you know, the challenges we face in this world. This, is, this was David's God. This is our God as well. He says he's his fortune. Look at Psalm 71. Psalm 71. And in Psalm 71, in verse 1, he says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me, he says. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. God was his uh, place of protection, that, that hedge that uh, protected David. And it's, uh, you know, it should give us that sense of peace in knowing that God is looking out for us, isn't he? God is, he cares about each and every one of us. He cares about his children. And when we focus on him as David, David said, I desired to basically put you first in my life, is what David is saying. And God gave him a place to raise him up, a place of protection, and God put a hedge of protection around him as well. There's kind of two sides to that hedge of protection as well. 
You know, we keep our eyes focused on the Lord. It protects us from uh, our spiritual enemies, but it protects us from ourselves as well, doesn't it? Because when we have our eyes on the Lord, where there's less chance of us allowing the distraction of sin and the distractions of this world to keep us from doing what God wants us to do, from, from being faithful and, and, of course, falling into sin. But he calls them his fortress. And then thirdly tonight, if you go back to Psalm number 18. Psalm 18, he says, The Lord is my rock, the Lord is my fortress, and the Lord is my deliverer. David says, the Lord is my deliverer. It was not an easy time. I mean, even while David was in the palace, before he fled from the palace, twice King Saul threw his spear at David, trying to kill him. I'm sure the first time it probably took David by surprise because he was there to you know, provide a, a soothing presence for the king as he would play his harp. And yet, King Saul, the one that uh, David felt uh, close to, I'm sure, when he was taken to the palace, we know that he was close to his son Jonathan, but they became very, uh, very close uh, friends, didn't they? And uh, yet, King Saul was trying to kill David. And so, when he finally realized that Saul was serious, and then all the different times that Saul came close and sought after his life, God did what? Even, even when you think back to the passage we read in 1 Samuel, you know, you've got Saul bearing down on David, and yet the Philistines are a problem over here, right? And you can't help but see that uh, as uh, the providence of God allowing that to distract King Saul, right? Almost God saying to Saul, let's get back to the real business of protecting the kingdom, right? Instead of wasting your time and energy in killing my chosen. And uh, needless to say, God was his deliverer. He delivered David from his enemies. He delivered David from, really, the greatest enemies that David has and the greatest enemies that we have. And that is, first and foremost, sin. You know, that's, that, is, that was David's greatest enemy got David in a lot of trouble, didn't it? And it's our enemy, too. When we're not saved and haven't trusted Christ as our Savior, sin will destroy us. The wages of sin is what? Death. And we know that death will be delivered into the lake of fire at the end. So we know that that is destruction. It, uh, sin is our enemy if we do not repent and trust Christ as our Savior. And so, God delivers us from death through how? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, through salvation in Him. But not only does He deliver us from sin, the first great enemy, the second one, of course, is hell. God has delivered us from hell, again, through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my deliverer, David says, my rock, my fortress, and my Deliverer. David experienced on a regular basis God delivering him from his enemies. So David knew he could trust God. And even when he fell into sin, God still delivered him. When he repented and turned from his sin and, and confessed his sin and turned from it, you know, God delivered him once again, didn't he? God is ready to be our rock our fortress, and our deliverer. Do you see God that way? No, that's the challenge for us tonight is when we think of our God and we think of the enemies that we might face in our lifetime, especially as believers, do we see God the same way David saw him as our rock and our fortress and our deliverer? Father, we thank you for our time tonight and for your word once again, and we just pray that we will have the same view of you that David had. David, King David came to recognize, Lord, just who you were and, and what you meant to him. And so, Father, help us to see you the same way. Lord, you want 
to be our rock, our place of high protection. You want to be our fortress, our place of refuge. And Father, you want to be our deliverer. So help us to see you that way, that we may keep our eyes upon you, that we may be like David with a desire to live in the house of the Lord, to be in your will and to focus on you every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen.